Okay. Well, welcome everyone to uh, what will now be the, the closing session of our, uh, our meeting on the Med. We are uh, fully cognizant of the fact that at the end of our session, there'll be a short break and then there's a wine tasting. So we will endeavor to stay on time. And um, the topic that we'd like to talk about, and I think what we'll try to also do is synthesize and integrate some of the key messages that we've heard throughout the conference on the key challenges, opportunities, and trends in gene editing and uh, gene therapy. Um, I have a distinguished group of colleagues. I'll, I'll let each of them in turn introduce themselves. And for those who don't know me, I'm Bob Smith. I'm responsible for leading the global gene therapy business within Pfizer's rare disease uh, business unit. I've been in this role for about seven years now and also serve on the ARM board and a number of the ARM board committees. So really excited to be here to close out the, the session and I'll turn it over to Fred. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Fred Chero, I'm the CEO of Logic Bio. <clears throat> uh, so Logic Bio is a um, um, clinical stage company developing two platforms a differentiated gene editing platform and um, a gene delivery platform to address early onset diseases. And so the, that would be it. You don't, you don't want me to talk for too long, right? No, 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 you did great. Okay. Good. good. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Very good, so I'll take all of your time. Thank you. Um, well, it's great, great, great to be here. Um, I'm a little bit the odd one out. I spend about 3% of a millennium working on AAV and AAV-related uh, gene therapy, mostly in, um, in, in academia, but then switched to, to industry, worked in pharma with Pfizer, and then uh, set up Handle Therapeutics, uh, uh, an AAV gene therapy that's uh, designed, that was set up to treat neurodegenerative diseases. Handel was then acquired by UCB, and now I um, help UCB establish, um, you know, the ambitious goal of having a significant part of their pipeline to consist of gene therapy um, assets. Great. Thank you, Michael. Mark? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark McClung. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Sangamo Therapeutics, so we're a genomics medicine company. Um, at core of our business is the Zinc Finger editing platform. Uh, we've got gene therapies, uh, one of which is partnered with uh, Pfizer in phase three. Uh, we have CAR Treg um, therapy um, based in our Valbon uh, facility. And then we also do uh, gene regulation. Um, so excited to be here, thank you. Thanks, Mark. And good afternoon, I'm Durham Wong Rieger. I am president and CEO of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, and I'm also chair of Rare Diseases International, which is the global alliance of patient organizations involved in uh, rare diseases. And I'm just really thrilled to be here. Um, as you can imagine, I guess I'm here representing certainly the patients and the patients' interests in this. And it's a huge, I appreciate very much the invitation from Bob to be here because for us, I think we're really excited to see not only more cell therapies coming through, more gene therapies coming through, but also the fact that patients are being involved and engaged in the actual research and in the access to these therapies. We're also going to be one of the ones that are gonna be very much involved in terms of the ongoing access to the therapy. So, huge opportunity to be here. My only hope is that next year, you're gonna see many, many more patients here. You need to have patients in your organization. We need to be part of these kinds of educational activities as well. Thanks, Durhan. <clears throat> Durhan, just to, to give you a sense, I think from the very opening of the conference yesterday morning, uh, patient centricity, the patient first mentality has been I think a theme through the whole meeting. So we can, we can circle back to that and we'll certainly incorporate that into our discussion uh, this afternoon. But thank you for graciously accepting our invitation to be here and your, your perspective and insights will be really valuable to the audience. Why don't we kick things off? Um, maybe Fred, we'll start with you. Your perspectives on some of the key challenges, opportunities, trends on the scientific technical aspects of gene editing and gene therapies. Sure. So, um, um, trends. There are many trends in gene editing and gene therapy these days. And, uh, but I, I think um, what amazes me, it's, uh, and it's, it sounds, when you listen to the people, it, it sounds uh, uh, quite simple. 
uh, in reality, uh, I think it's uh, still very difficult what we are trying to do here. Um, and uh, over the last 20 years or so, uh, industry has made a lot of uh, <coughs> sorry um, um, progress. But uh, I remember going to some <coughs> sorry so going to some meeting. I have some water here. Uh, going to some meeting where somebody was saying uh, delivery, delivery, and delivery is one of the challenges. I think I, I might have said that. Uh, maybe it was you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say you were right, because uh, 20 years after, I don't think it was you 20 years ago, but uh, 20 years after, we are still struggling a little bit with delivery. Uh, many progress has been done. Some, product, some products are approved, obviously, as everybody knows. But it's still an area where uh, we need to continue to do a lot of, uh, a lot of progress. I think. Mm -hmm. Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, <clears throat> well, along the same, uh, same lines. So through the past 30 years, uh, you know, we've come to recognize that gene therapy still is a somewhat underdeveloped modality uh, from a drug development per, uh, perspective. And that underdeveloped modality now meets the grown-up world of drug development, and, and I think what this really means is that we have to build a plane while we're flying it. So we're developing these medicines, and, and um, we see that success can be, can be had. But at the same time, what we have to do is to continuously innovate um, the technology underlying this, and, and maybe also to continuously understand what the technology is based on um, in, in the sense of biology, which reaches the delivery bit and, and, and so on, and to, to, to make advances in this space. And what that, of course, contains is a, is a certain risk, and, and, and that is when we look from a patient perspective, what is the risk benefit? We're developing something, and because we're developing, we don't know the outcome quite yet of what is being developed. And then we have to calculate the risk benefit with this. And I think what this needs is, is really an interdisciplinary discussion all the way from patients back into through the drug development to, to the academics that come up with this to understand what, what the unknowns are and to make them more known in this space and then to, to incorporate that into a risk benefit balance. So that's, that's I think, is a, is, is a good challenge to have because brings discussions and hopefully also solutions. Yeah. And probably also um, a catalyst for the concept of continuous improvement, continuous learning. It's yeah. almost like in every new trial that started, every patient that's treated, some group, some sponsor within the sector um, is learning. And um, I think that's something that will continue to accelerate as well. Mark, welcome. You know, your, your thoughts on this. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I'm going to pile on the delivery side of things, but, um, you know, maybe just to illustrate it a bit. So, we, you know, when we take our zinc fingers, and we've got zinc finger nucleases now that are being applied uh, for gene regulation in CNS diseases. And what's interesting is that the engineering is easy, is relatively easy to do. It's taken us 20 years to get here, but, um, you know, we can dial up or dial down and we can actually um, edit out off-target events. So you can get this really exquisite engineered product. But then when you start looking at where you want to apply the, you know, these different zinc fingers in terms of CNS, you have to target different parts of the brain because the diseases are in different parts of the brain. So the search for um, you know, capsids continues. Um, and what we found is when you take a look at capsids, those, those that we're developing, as well as uh, those that others, they really do target different parts of the brain. And so it takes a long time uh, to develop those. And so, you know, investing more in our capsids, but also scouring um, those, you know, those capsids that are available and seeing whether they're gonna work, I, I think are really key to really unlock what could be an incredible um, opportunity for patients and a lot of these, cure, um, you know, potential cures that uh, patients are looking for. Yeah, maybe not to, kind of overstated, but it, it seems like the technology suite that you guys have assembled is almost like the gene editing, gene therapy, Swiss Army knife. You could pretty much do anything with it, um, depending upon what your intended therapeutic effect would be. Durhan, maybe we'll, um, 
Yeah, you know, it's a bit overwhelming. And I was really, number one, so delighted to see so many different kinds of topics being discussed here in terms of challenges and opportunities. Obviously, the science um, and obviously the advances. I mean, in some respects, and just full disclosure, I have two children, both with uh, rare diseases, one genetic and one not. I have a husband who actually has a genetic cardiovascular disease, he's got Parkinson's disease, he also has a rare um, utility disorder. I claim that every decade he seems to get a new condition, so this is not working out very well for us. No, but it's really exciting to see the progress. On the other hand, it's also so slow, because how long have we been waiting for this, right? And I think it's exciting to see, though, the certainly at the research end and the developer ends, also the discussions around payers and the recognition that you can develop the science, you can get the, you know, the medications there, but if we aren't thinking about the ecosystem and the environment and how ready we are for it, then we're not going to be able to do that. So it's good to see it. I think I was a little disappointed because I don't think it's fully being recognized. And I think you said it very well, though, you know, and that is part of the challenge is actually getting the patients much more fully involved to help understand what are the benefits and risks. How do the patients feel about this? And I think there's a lot of presumption sometimes in terms of what the patients are willing to accept as a risk and also what patients really do see as benefits. So I'm happy to see more of that discussion taking place, but I think there needs to be much more of that at the beginning level. I'm also very excited to hear the discussions around you know, access, but it's not just around payment, and I think that's the big part. From our perspective, I head up um, also um, with the ERDIC, the International Research Consortium on Rare Diseases and Rare Diseases International, and now in partnership with the WHO, a working group on global access to medicines for rare diseases. And included in that is really our wanting to talk about the advanced therapeutic products and certainly around cell and gene therapies. And I think this is an important challenge for everybody to think about, and that is, where's the global community? We're so concerned, and I was really very pleased last year with some support from pharma that we get um, three of the global workshops on gene therapies. And I can tell you, we had so many people that were coming in from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America. And the question always is, and when do we get it? Where is it coming for us? Recognizing that at the end of the day, when you've got healthcare systems that are not able to provide the ongoing kind of care, are going to be providing the ongoing kind of medications, Gene therapy, cell therapies are going to actually be the most economical, not, as well as the best impact in terms of the health system. So I really want to encourage everybody you know, who's in this space to work with us, and, and I know you do, and I'm not saying this as a negative to anybody, because I was really pleased to see a lot of it, but I think we need to really focus on it. We have to think about access at the same time that we're thinking about delivery, and it's not just money. It's right, having the systems in place, it's having the infrastructures, it's having the diagnosis in place. And it's looking at comprehensive solutions as opposed to the delivery of the therapy. So again, I'm not trying to do it as a criticism. I just think we're so excited about this and we're so prepped for it that we really want to think about how do we deliver it. People are waiting. Yeah, right, and I think the theme of the session here, the challenges and the opportunities, I think you articulated that really well. And Maybe, maybe. I can sure, reply. please. And, and so, totally agree with you. And I'm sorry, Duran, uh, if we are not going faster, uh, it's it's uh, it's a pretty complex. But I think we should not forget the vision for this type of technologies, which is amazing to me. It's uh, it's to drug some diseases which yeah. have not been druggable to date, and and so and by definition, more, more complex diseases because otherwise they would have been uh, tackled in a way or another by another modality. And, and also, it's for this, some diseases where there is a treatment already, it's being able to provide maybe a more uh, user-friendly or patient-friendly patient uh, treatment and help the patient to forget about the burden of this terrible disease they are suffering from. So I think it's still, I mean, it's, that's what keeps up, I mean, kick us uh, out of the bed every morning, I think, but uh, so we'll, do, we'll try to, to go faster. But uh, there is a great vision there. Yeah, and Fred, maybe maybe just articulate a little bit, kind of your philosophy on your firm's philosophy about that balance of benefit and risk, uh, especially in areas where the course of the disease may not be very well understood. You know, from pot potentially the onset of the etiology and the symptoms, 
to a potential treatment and the resolution, like what is that benefit? Is it clearly understood for all diseases or do you think it's an area where we have to do a lot more work to understand better? Um, I, I think it's, uh, and it's, it's an area where we need to, to do a lot of work and there are some, de by definition I think we, we understand better the diseases where there is already a treatment because it has, we've been able to establish some, some basis, some endpoint, some, some, uh, some measures of success. But uh, in, in our case, for example, we are going after a disease called MMA, methyl malonic acidemia, yeah. where there is absolutely uh, no treatment to date. It's, there is just a diet for these patients. And, uh, and it's very difficult to, uh, I mean, when you open up uh, a, a field like that, uh, you have to work with the, the, the patients, with the physicians, with the regulators. Uh, and, and it's quite complex to know if you are going in the right direction or not. And if the benefits you, I mean, to understand if the benefits you're going to be able to bring at some risk, obviously, oh. uh, will, will, be, will be sufficient, you know, because you don't have any, I mean, you don't have a lot of uh, benchmark in some ways. Yeah. If I can Michael, jump. I can see you're biting at the, the bit here to chime in. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think I see an opportunity to, to sort of connect these two, these two lines of thought, right? <clears throat> because also from a drug development perspective, risk-benefit analysis is something um, that companies are relatively good at uh, in general. But are we for a modality that is based on a one-time treatment, that is based often on endpoints that don't show up immediately, that is based on a scenario where we're not currently um, able to switch on and off the effect of our <coughs> Our medicine, so it's uh, the risk-benefit analysis is, is is difficult, I think, in in many of these diseases, and that's precisely, in my view, as we also discussed before, where patients can come in um, with the experience of the disease and reframe the benefit or reframe the the way that patients look at this risk. So I think what you're saying is is really relevant also for the practicalities of drug development in the sense of um, you know, defining maybe in some of the diseases a new way of, of addressing risk and benefit. More. <clears throat> so, I, I mean, I, I, won't, I won't talk specifically about it, but I, I think, you know, in one of the areas that we're active in with one of our gene therapies, um, you know, one of the approaches um, companies are taking is looking for um, uh, AAVs that have different tropisms for different tissues. And they think that that's going to provide a therapeutic benefit. Now, it's early days, but what we're seeing is the emergence of very different, um, you know, early signals of toxicity profiles. Mm. You know, uh, myocarditis is an example, um, you know, and, and, and other things. So, it, you know, there I think we have to just go in eyes wide open that sometimes you think you're clever when you're de designing a capsid or a promoter, but you really don't know what's going to happen until you actually deliver it to the patient. And then because it's a lifelong therapy, you've, you know, those patients that have elected to join the clinical trials, God bless them actually, um, are gonna have to live with that. And so I think, you know, it just puts more pressure on us to really be thoughtful about what we're doing as we continue to develop, develop the different components of the therapy. Can I just pick up on what Mark sure. was saying? Because that's so very important, but it gets to a different point and maybe a bit what Michael was saying, and that is, engaging the patient, but also education. I mean, that's why I was so thrilled to be able to do the sessions that we did. And actually, Sangamo um, has, I don't know if anybody knows this, has some of the most amazing patient education materials, probably the best that I've seen in terms of being able to explain gene editing, gene therapy. And, you know, and, but what you're saying there is really, really important, and that is engaging the patients, providing the education. We're all looking at the benefits. We're all wanting it, but as you say, there's risk. And if we aren't fully, not only transparent, but also you know, sharing with people the fact that we don't know kind of what some of those risks might be, and we don't know what the outcomes might be, either both good and bad, right? But you've got to engage people in it. And we do know what happens when unexpected you know, bad things happen. You know? And if the people aren't fully partners in that, not just being told, but they feel like they're a partner in it, and they have accepted the fact that, okay, this could happen, and I appreciate what it is, especially when we're talking about children sometimes. I think that's important. So 
engaging the patient also in terms of the education, engaging the patient in terms of partnerships, but also making them truly part of that research. Not to say, you know, you, you own it, but to really have been a partner in it. I think that's so very important. So I just wanted to pick up on that because we aren't doing yet enough to actually, I think, provide that full breadth of education. And that's on us as well as patients. We get so excited about it and we're so hyped about it that sometimes when we want to look beyond what the possible, you know, it's like all these medicines that give you all the list of all the adverse things that happen. You can die from this and you'll get this from that. And people kind of gloss over it, right? You don't even hear it. And then, you know, because you're so focused on the benefits, but we've got to hear it and we've got to be part of that. And Duran, one of the things, just to add just quickly, one of the things that we're looking at now is trying to revamp the um, informed consent. You know, the informed consents on, on, you know, I hope there's no lawyers in the room, but by the time you get finished with them, they're so complex that the average patient can't interpret it. And so we need to figure out a way to really make sure that we're communicating the risks as well as the potential benefits of this. And it's something that, uh, that we're really taking a hard look at through our advocacy team and our development team to see what we can do to push that forward. Yeah, and I know, Mark, maybe just a give a plug for some of the work that I know Sangamo and Pfizer have been involved with the NYU, New York University, United States, Langone um, Center for Bioethics is doing a lot of work in terms of gene editing and gene therapies in the pediatric patient population and the informed consent process there where essentially parents are consenting for their child, which is, you know, an area that you really want to do the very best in terms of communication and education. Michael, I know you were going to chime in there, please. Yeah, so well, maybe I've missed the slot a little bit, but I wanted to go back to, to the side effect and to the teaching and so on and so forth. We have to also be aware of the fact that the technology that's underlying these things might actually be a bit more complicated than, than we think. So it's not just, and, and I'm fully aware that, that you, you know this, but the you know component is not just the capsid and it's uh, the transgene <coughs> construct in, for example, AAV bits, but it's also the manufacturing process yeah. and the contaminations or the potency effects that the manufacturing process has, which then makes a discussion about risks much more complicated, right? So we can't say, oh, I'm going to take an AAV9 and th then everything's okay, and uh, maybe the DRG will have a side effect or, uh, and so on, because we actually don't know. We don't know what part of this drug product might cause side effect because, and this is why I wanted to take advantage of that moment when you mentioned it, because we don't have standardization uh, across the field. So a vector that Sangamo makes is likely a different vector than the one that I make or the one that Pfizer will make. Um, and, and that's not because two out of three don't know what they're doing. Everybody knows what they're doing, but it's complicated. And to, <clears throat> what that means is that we have to find ways to, to, to standardizing, to evaluating, well, first of all, the efficacy of our medicine and, and also the risk to, um, you know, that is involved at certain dosages and so on and so forth. Yeah. So. And I think the, you know, the overall sense I have is the field is continuing to advance to minimize variances in product characteristics as a source of clinical outcome yes. variability. Um, the more uniform the product, the more robust the manufacturing process, um, the more reliable it is over multiple batches in the production process, I think will all help to address that issue. But it is, to your, to your point, still a significant challenge for the industry. It, it, it does help for, for your internal pr project, so you can build a, a lot of confidence. But as soon as a report comes out from a competing company, for example, that there is an, an SAE or an adverse event related to, to the manufacturing, you don't anymore because there's no standard, right? So you cannot compare your sturdy pro uh, process with somebody else's. And, and I think that makes it difficult also for the field to learn, right? Is that effect because of the medicine, of the capsid, of the disease, or is it because of the manufacturing? And, and somehow we need to get this under control, yeah. I find. Just on this same point, maybe just a question to get your insight and your expertise is, what about the variability in the transgene um, 
protein product. Maybe I don't understand what you mean by variability in the protein product. So, for example, changes, maybe even very small changes in, in the construct of a transgene could lead to potentially different across disease indications with the protein product. So, for example, a B domain deleted uh, protein for hemophilia A as an example. Even small single nucleotide changes in the transgene construct could lead to yes. variability as well. No, absolutely. And, and so in the development phase of the things that I've been involved in, I haven't really seen this firsthand, but in the research phase of my career, I, you know, I've, I've really been taught that we need to look at every nucleotide in this because the, the outcomes are potentially um, very difficult and a, a diff very um, significant. And the problem is, on top of that, where do you evaluate them, right? Um, a change might be relevant in your rodent model or not relevant in your rodent model, tolerated in your rodent model, but then show up in your non-human primate model or even even worse than in human clinical trials. So the, the species barrier um, based on the on the modality that we're using, we're dealing with viruses, and for, fortunately, viruses have species barriers. Um, and AAV is no different there, and so therefore it behaves differently in different 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 animals, and that makes the evaluation of these type of risks, in yeah. fact, quite quite complex. Yeah. Why don't we? Um, I know we're clicking through our time is flying by here. Let me. Um, let me make a little bit of a pivot here and talk a little bit about some of the challenges, opportunities, and trends on the clinical slash regulatory perspective. And Fred and Mark, maybe if you want to share your your perspectives there. Mark. Okay. So, um, so obviously we've seen two sets of guidance come out recently mm -hmm. in gene therapy and the cell therapy. You know, I, I asked actually asked my team to go through and, and educate me on what this means and whether or not that has any implications on our programs. And thankfully, most of it we're doing. Although you, you do see you know, some areas around safety, um, concerns around dorsal root ganglion, things like that, that have come out. And I, I think the team's now figuring out how they, how they actually you know, mitigate that risk going into the, the trials, as an example. Um, so it's good to see that, that things are you know, progressing from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and, um, and hopefully, we continue to have the opportunity to kind of get the changes in the regulatory environment early enough that you can actually impact the programs and continue the pace of moving these, you know, medicines forward. Uh, but we didn't see any big surprises in it uh, in the update. Well, so I agree that the reason why I wanted Mark to speak yeah. first, but uh, but what what I think is. Uh, I mean, something to keep in mind is we are at the cutting edge of innovation. You know, even if it, we are there for a long time, it's still very innovative. And like in every modality, when you are innovating, you need to work with, uh, with all the stakeholders. And I think on the regulatory standpoint or on the clinical standpoint, we, we, it's a dialogue between the regulatory bodies and the, and the sponsor. You were saying that every trial, every new patient will learn something. Yeah. I fully agree. And, and there is, we need to be able to continue to, to have this dialogue to help the regulator to define the right boundaries of the, regu the regulation and to help, I mean, to educate also in some ways our, our technology to the, to the physicians because uh, it's also some diseases, as I said before, which have not been treated before. And, and, uh, and, and if there is not this very, very open communication, some information will be lost, and, and the field will not progress as, as uh, quickly as it can, I think. So here I see a lot of opportunities, but, but we have, I mean, it's our duty to be able to save them, in some way, yeah. grab them. What's, what's also your sense with, as more and more trials are started, more and more patients are being treated, different types of transgene proteins, whether secreted proteins, structural proteins, transporter proteins, um, intracellular enzymatic proteins, you know, all of these are also showing differences in safety 
aspects, maybe related to the capsid, maybe related to the transgene protein and your sense about the tolerance of reported safety events with the regulatory agencies. And so I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask too because we are currently on clinical hold. But, uh, so we're, so cannot, we're, so we're we. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's right. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think, I mean, I think the regulators are doing their job and we need to continue to do our yeah. job. And, and we are pushing some biology, I mean, handmade biology into in vivo biology. And as you were asking in the previous question about what about the differences between the protein produced, Today, we are not even sure that every day the patients, the same cells will produce exactly the same protein. No. So we, I think we have to be very humble you know, with this technology. Uh, it, it will work, I'm very convinced, yeah. but it might, it might take a, a, a little bit of time. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to put you on the spot there, Fred, <laughs> okay. I, I know. <laughs> but uh, the reason kind of behind my question was that it gets back to the discussion about the different players in the system, sponsors, regulatory agencies, and the patient communities about that trade-off of benefit and risk. Um, and it may vary depending upon the patient population, the course of a disease, how progressive it is, how rapidly, versus maybe something that's more of a stable chronic disease. And Durhan, I know that you and I have had conversations about this and how can you incorporate the patient's view into some of these safety-related findings? You know, the challenge in all of this, of course, is that your very success is going to be the downfall. The more and more we do, and the more and more you have in terms of successful gene therapies, with, in fact, as you say, fewer kind of major adverse events or deaths, right? the more people will expect that and think that's going to always be the norm. I remember when, you know, way back when the first child died, you know, from a gene therapy hemophilia, everything stopped for about a year. The most devastated were the patients, you know, because recognizing that, you know, one death is, is, is a tragedy, but it shouldn't really stop. And I think we need to build into it the fact that there are going to be safety issues. And where's the balance? It goes back to what you were saying, Mark, is that how do we actually actively engage patients? And also recognizing, as you say, individuals will be different, and they will also be different if they've got some alternatives. If you've got, you know, really good therapies, and so this is an alternative that will allow you to be maybe free from chronic, you know, transfusions, it may be something slightly different than if there's nothing else and therefore, this is going to be, you know, the chance that you've got, or if it's for an infant. So I think needing to have that kind of open dialogue and being very upfront about it. You know, you think about gene therapy, it's a little bit like space exploration, right? You know, we recognize there's huge risks on it, but the big difference is that space exploration was really controlled by governments for a long time. The variation, as you say, was really kind of taken out of it. And so even though we had tragedies, we kind of recognized that, okay, somebody was sitting on top of it. And you didn't have to worry about the regulator. In this case, we're kind of making it so that you've got a lot of commercial entities that are out there doing all kinds of different things. But the trade-off is that, you know what, how many tourists have gone up into space? How much has this been able, available to the public versus how many people are benefiting from, you know, potential cell? Uh, you know, cell and gene therapy. But I think that level of dialogue has got to be raised. You know, we were talking about it before, you know, Michael, how do we, how do we educate up, right, the public and the patient to become part of that dialogue? And it isn't just, can I write you a clear informed consent? I think we need to raise the level of understanding and awareness, you know, among anybody who might use it, that these are the kind of issues and concerns that you have to be, it's like driving an automobile. You know, you've got to understand what the real potential downsides might be before you kind of give somebody a license and a key. I think if I can, yeah, I, I, I think this is a really important aspect uh, that, that you bring up with regards to the different, different approaches that we can use in gene therapy, right? Different, and therefore uh, address different, uh, different diseases. But again, it's complicated. Um, in in sense of up to now, uh, most of the gene therapies that have been successful or look to be successful have been in diseases which have very large therapeutic windows. So we can overexpress because we can't really um, 
fine-tune the levels of expressions yet. So that, therefore, we need a large therapeutic window. But this is an opportunity for new technologies. And you know, can we develop technologies where we can tune, tune the expression and therefore maybe get into diseases which have a much more narrow therapeutic window, let's say channels in CMS or proteins and, and, and you know, this stuff where 20% makes a difference or 40% makes a difference in sense of, in sense of over, overexpression. But I think that's the sort of areas that we need to start working on and, and, and then really start building a pipeline that takes these aspects into, into account. The early part of the field, the pipeline has been sort of in, 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 in the right top quadrant of benefit versus technical feasibility, if you want. So yeah, you can do it, and there's a benefit. That's good. But I, and, and a lot of the companies I've seen have gone me too into that, in, into that quadrant. And, and I think where the real potential lies, not the challenge, but the, poten the potential opportunity lies is, is to find technologies that allow us to get out of that quadrant to, to tackle diseases that maybe have a smaller therapeutic window and, and that maybe work on different molecular pathways. Yeah. And Michael, just along, along that same vein, do you think that that is a potential advantage for some of the gene editing and gene regulation approaches rather than classical gene transfer? Yeah. <laughs> you would say yes, I would say yes, yes. Well, I would say we don't know, but we're hopeful, <laughs> right? And, yeah. and we'll, we'll find out. But you know, the, you know it, it, it is a bit of a, one of these, you know, do I want to do 100% or do I want it at 50 or 60 or 70? And, and you know, animal models only going to tell you so much. But we have, to be, we have to really be ready for it, and I think this is really conceptually a good argument for some of the gene editing uh, approaches, because in many cases, half-lives of proteins are not known. So we actually don't know if we reach a plateau at a certain point when we express, or when we reach the plateau, how do you regulate this? So are you, do you have a milestone that's half a year in, or a year in, or two years in? Uh, that depends on the biochemistry of, of the protein, right? In the sense of it's the halfway, half, um, the, the rate of, of protein turnover such that we can actually reach fairly early a steady state and therefore can say, okay, this is now safe, right? We know we have reached a level. Um, so these things are not, not simple. Yeah. Fred? Any thoughts? Well, I wanted to rebound on uh, what Duran said about the, the patients. I think it was your yeah. initial question. But uh, I, I have to say that in the 23 years I've been connected with rare diseases, uh, I've always been amazed by, by the patients, I mean, and the patients' organizations. I, I think uh, uh, the patients are the experts of their disease. And, and it's not only us to educate the patients, it's the patients to educate us a lot. And I think we, we, we never do too much of that. You know? yeah. and, and, uh, and also, when we talk about technologies, that as when we are talking about today, for me, they are heroes, you know, and, and especially in our case where, I mean, we, we are, uh, we've been allowed to enroll patients as young as six months or older. Uh, you can imagine, I mean, being, you were talking about the parents signing for the kids, but it's, uh, I mean, the parents are, in my view, heroes, uh, but it shows a little bit also about their uh, level of dis desperation. And, and, um, and, um, and I, 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 I agree with Duran about the transparent communication which needs to be yeah. established and, and, and continuous, continuously. And, and, and back to, to what you were saying, when uh, unfortunately we've been informed that we had to stop temporarily, I hope, the, the, the trial. Uh, it was great to see that the, the president of the uh, OAA, the Organic uh, Acidemia Association, uh, called me and insisted to send a message to the whole company and said, it happens, but don't give up. I think it's uh, I mean, for when you do difficult things as we are doing. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah. yeah, we've experienced um, similar feedback and engagement from the patient communities on some of our clinical programs. And it's really quite profound um, how impactful what we're doing is for them. And they 
obviously celebrate the successes, but they also really want the persistence and determination to push through the challenges and, and the setbacks. So. I think the setbacks are things that need to be more openly shared. You know, so people not only can anticipate it, but understand kind of why they occur. And that, you know, they aren't all the same either. And I think, you know, our, my biggest fear is that, you know, we will have something that would be somewhat catastrophic. I don't know, somewhat catastrophic can even be a term. I guess it's either catastrophic or not. But, you know, if that were to happen, you know, would there be such backlash that it could set things way back? But I think the more people are aware of what the possible challenges are, even the dialogue that you're having here is something that people would so benefit from recognizing. The science isn't like boom, 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 boom. The science is still very much an exploratory stage. And it's that, you know, you're saying, Bob, you know, what do the patients say? The patients would say, continue, you know. We support what you're doing, but we need to know kind of, you know, what some of those challenges are as well in order for us to do it. And I think I am concerned that, you know, something will happen and we'll end up with, you know, this sort of an anti-gene kind of a movement. We have, you know, it seems we have anti-vaxxers where suddenly, you know, we get this huge movement that says, no, we shouldn't be doing that. You know, it's sort of like the word gene editing. It's picked up so much bad vibes that I almost wish people wouldn't even use it, call it something else because it makes it kind of into a realm of an area where people have been said, don't go there. So mm -hmm. I think we need to just educate people much more and bring people more into that conversation. Mark, any, any thoughts to share on the, the topic of setting expectations with the patient communities on the, the characteristics of gene editing and gene therapies? So, I mean, you know, we engage early with patients. They inform our preclinical research priorities. Um, we have between eight and nine, um, so one a month patient um, discussions where we have two to three patients informing us. And, and it's so incredibly helpful to understand, you know, how the disease really impacts them. And, it, and it's not just the disease, you know, the disease component of it. It's how it affects their, you know, their life and the life choices that they need to make in some cases where they don't want to pass on a gene to a, a, an offspring and so they choose to adopt and say, I'm going to be the one that stops this from happening in my family for the rest of my life because I've lost 10 people over the years with this disease. And it's just incredible, and, but it, it sort of, um, to me, it energizes the company to understand what the patients want, but to move forward and, and really try to tackle this. You know, you mentioned earlier, you're talking about the, the Philadelphia Jesse Gelsinger. You know, that was, I, I was at GSK at the time, um, and, and we cut off ties with Jim Wilson's lab. Everybody got afraid of it. And you take a look at the amount of time it's taken to get, build up the momentum again, and that's a shame. I think we have to understand that if it's, if it's not negligent and it's something that we learn, we address it, we make sure it doesn't happen again, but I think we owe it to patients to keep it forward because they do want these therapies. Yeah, there's, there's certainly an, an aspect of it that you want to deliver a, the potential of hope uh, for a transformational clinical benefit, but balance with the realistic expectations that there's still a lot of risk to be, you know, undone. Um, yeah. Michael, I know we're, we're kind of winding down. I know that there was one topic in particular you wanted to share some thoughts about, which is the application of more gene editing and gene therapy approaches to more common prevalent diseases. And so I will give you the, the mic uh, to close things out on a highly optimistic tone. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Um, no, I think we're bound to go there, right? So I think rare diseases are clearly the match for gene therapy and gene editing bits because we can take a variable out of the equation, which is, well, do we actually target the, right, uh, target the right target? We do because it's a genetically defined disease. Um, but along the way, we've created a lot of hope, right, in the sense of, well, if this works in rare diseases, maybe we can do this in, in more common diseases, as, for example, neurodegenerative diseases that will become amongst the biggest challenge for, for society over the years. And, and this modality, at least in principle, has, has the potential to do this. And what I wanted to do is you know, kind of get 
get your ideas as to you know where 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 the challenge is going to be once we go into multigenic, more complex diseases that are underlying there. And this is you know, are we ready to to deal with these additional challenges and 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 hope that we get through them. But I think the time to start thinking about it is now because, again, clinical readouts will look different. Endpoints will, will need to be defined differently. Maybe we have to add additional technologies such as AI and so on in the evaluation of, of endpoints. Um, but if we want to get there, I think we need to start, start thinking about it now. And that's what, we're trying, what we have been trying to, to do with with our assets and and you know I'm wondering if we can get there with the regulators also because it'll be a challenge there and, and the patients. I mean at that point it's no longer going to be just patients, it's going to be the public. No. And I think that's kind of where again a lot of education needs to be, take place, a lot of dialogue needs to take place, but the challenge as you well know is that you're not going to have a uniform public. It would be nice if you know we just do a lot of good scientific education and people will be there. And as we have seen, you know, certainly through this pandemic, it doesn't matter what the science says. If you don't get on the right side of what people's attitudes are, what their opinions are, what the biases are, we're going to end up with a very split, you know, uh, kind of a public opinion. And I'm not sure that will work then when we're trying to think about, as you say, some of these large scale diseases, which could really benefit from some forms of gene editing, gene modification, but you know, could run into some real headwinds when you start to hit some of those kinds of attitudes. And it doesn't even need to take the majority of the public to be negative in order for you know, something to become full stop. Well, well said. Um, <laughs> Fred, Michael, Mark, Jahan, thank you very much for participating in the panel. And for those of you in the audience, thanks for your attention and hanging in there to the very end. Um, please uh, give a round of applause for our panelists here.